Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Riverwood Presbyterian Church. Uh, those who are here this morning, but also you who are joining us online. This morning, we're going to begin our service using Psalm 150 as our call to worship. It is a psalm of praise and adoration to our triune God. So if you would stand with me as we read responsively Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Come, let us worship. We'll continue to worship by singing a setting of Psalm 150. Sing praise to the Lord. Let's pray together. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you wherever we are this Lord's day, in the sanctuary, in our homes, we come before you with songs and shouts of praise. We come before you as your humble people, and we join with the choirs of heaven, with the church universal, and with your glorious creation to acclaim your holy and majestic name. As we worship in all of its aspects, we ask that you would bless us with your Holy Spirit. Bless and be with our pastor as he brings your word to us. And be with us. Open our hearts and minds to hear, to understand, to be comforted and instructed. As we worship, show us Jesus in all his beauty and wonder. Give us that sense of wonder as we continue to pray, as he himself came and taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you are able, please remain standing as we begin our time of confession with the reading of God's Word. Our New Testament reading is from 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 10. In it, the apostle speaks of the imitation of Christ by the Thessalonian church, and in doing so, he gives us a standard of faith. Hear the Word of God. We give thanks always for all of you constantly mentioning you, mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love, 
and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report that concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This morning's reading from 1 Thessalonians It's one of my favorite passages in that book as Paul gives thanks to God for believers there in Thessalonica. He acknowledges their work of faith, their labor of love, and their steadfastness and hope, but notice that is all in our Lord Jesus Christ. He says he he recognizes that the Spirit of God has come and worked in his people powerfully, that the Spirit has come with full conviction and evidence of that as he lays it out within that or among that evidence is here near the end of this passage how you turned to God from idols he mentions their repentance repentance is an evidence of God's spirit's work in the lives of his people repentance is turning away from ourselves away from our passions away from our idols and looking to God the one the only the living and true God so as we worship today Let's do so, confessing our sin, repenting as the Spirit works within us. If you would join me, please, using the corporate confession, and then we'll have a few moments for silent confession as well. So pray with me. Almighty God, you are gracious, merciful, and powerful to save. Today, soften our hearts to hear the gospel and enable us to receive the word with faith and love. We confess that we have placed our hope and confidence in things other than you. We stubbornly hold on to these idols of comfort, wealth, need for control, selfish pleasure, and the praise of others. Please forgive us. Holy Spirit, work powerfully within us and equip us to serve the living and true God. Free us from the enslaving power of sin and liberate us to worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now lift your heads and hear the good news. And as you hear from Colossians 2, I want you to focus on how God acts and we are acted upon. By faith in Jesus Christ, you have been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Though we were dead in our trespasses and the uncircumcision of our flesh, God made us alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. He did this by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside by nailing it to the cross. Jesus Christ gave his life for our salvation and on the cross declared, it is finished. 
In Jesus Christ, you have been saved and your sins are forgiven. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. This morning, let's respond to this message of God's grace by singing Beneath the Cross of Jesus. And let me turn your attention before we sing the second stanza. Listen to these words. Upon the cross of Jesus, mine eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my stricken heart with tears, two wonders I confess the wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. Let's sing together beneath the cross of Jesus. encourage you to continue to worship through the giving of tithes and offerings. You can give as you go out the door. There's a plate for you to drop your tithe or offering in, or you can give online using the link provided on the church's website. Let's continue uh, to worship through the affirmation of our faith. So, Mr. Hopper, if you'll come and lead us in that. Riverwood Presbyterian Church is a confessional church. Uh, we've just confessed our sins, but that's not what we talk about uh, when we speak of and describe ourselves as being a confessional church. We're speaking of what we believe, of orthodoxy. In our affirmation of faith, we use the creeds, the catechisms of the church, even scripture, but all of it's based on scripture and strictly on strict scripture to affirm what we believe. This is unlike the idea that whatever you believe is okay because you believe it sincerely. That uh, is rampant in some places. Uh, a couple of uh, couple of weeks ago, we looked at some questions and answers from the Westminster Shorter Catechism regarding aspects of our redemption. Today, we go again to that same source and define what we believe about saving faith and repentance. Please join me now as we affirm our holy faith. Christian, what does God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse due to us for sin? To escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires us faith in Jesus Christ, repentance unto life, and with the diligent use of all outward means, whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption. <laughs> 
What is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. What is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ does with peace and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to seated. To sing that wonderful ancient hymn, a response of the church, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, that follows what we just read because we see that it is by faith in Christ and his repentance that are both gifts of God, gifts of God's grace. So all praise is to God even for our salvation as we respond to his saving work through faith and repentance. This morning, as we prepare to hear the, the Word of God read and proclaimed, let's sing together, O breath of life come sweeping through us. This is a prayer to the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing the first three stanzas before the sermon and the, the last two afterwards. And hear these words, O breath of love, come breathe within us, renewing thought and will and heart. Come, love of Christ, afresh to win us. Revive your church in every part. We're going to hear about the church being revived and renewed, even the Old Testament church this morning. So let this be our prayer as well as we sing together. And if you're able, please stand with me as we sing. seated. We will stand again in just a few moments for the reading of God's Word. But before we do, just a little bit of reminder. The year was 445 B.C., and under Nehemiah's leadership, the walls around Jerusalem had been rebuilt. But the community, the covenant community, was fractured by injustice, fragmented socioeconomically and politically. We can relate to that in our nation today and also in much of the universal church. Well, the wall was completed there in Jerusalem in only 52 days, just over seven weeks, the wall rebuilt, the gates restored. It was completed five days before the beginning of the seventh month in the Hebrew calendar. 
that month was significant for God's people. If you looked back in the commands and statutes that God had given Moses back at Sinai, there were a list of corporate gatherings and feasts, festivals that God instituted and gave to His people that were intended to inform and shape the lives of His covenant people. So those feasts and festivals were crucial. Well, in the month of in the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar, there were several such gatherings. On the first day of the seventh month was the Feast of Trumpets. On the tenth day of that same month was the Day of Atonement. That's a day in which the priest would ceremonially cover, cover over the pollution of sin and the separation it had created between God and His people. On the fifteenth day of that same month was to begin the Feast of Booths. And it would last a total of eight days. So the seventh month is filled with these reminders of God's relationship with His people. So the timing of the restoration of the wall there around Jerusalem was providentially five days before the beginning of the seventh month. The miracle of the rebuilding wasn't only how fast it was done, but when it was completed. Here's a lesson to learn from Nehemiah, and that is the sovereignty of God's timing. That we can trust His timing. Now, in my own experience, and maybe yours as well, we often don't get the opportunity to see that until it's far behind us, until we look back and begin to understand how God was working and moving. But we can learn to trust it even in the middle of the uncertainties of life. That God's timing is indeed perfect. For us. Well, on the first day of that month, of that seventh month, the people in Jerusalem, as we read about several weeks ago, they gathered, we're told, as one man, and they listened to the word of God read by Ezra, the priest. They received that word with faith and love. On the second day, the leaders in the community gathered back together and they studied God's Word and they found there the, the testimony or the, the writing about the Feast of Booths. Now, Nehemiah doesn't mention about the Day of Atonement, but it's in Scripture right next to the mention of the Feast of Booths. So it would, it would seem that certainly they read about it and probably even observed the Day of Atonement, though Nehemiah doesn't record it. But he does tell us that on the 15th day of the month, indeed, the people came together again and celebrated the Feast of Booths. We looked at that last week. It's that week-long celebration where they're commanded to rejoice even while they are living in temporary shelters. Houses, huts made of sticks and vines and leaves just as the rainy season is beginning. And they live in these temporary shelters for a week so that they would remember the permanency of God's grace. Every year they're to, to celebrate this feast, to remember that God is their provider, God is their protector. Now that celebration would have ended on the 22nd day of that seventh month. Now, in today's reading, we're going to hear that it's just two days later, the 24th, and yet again the people were gathered together. But this time, the nature of their convocation was drastically different. With that, if you're able, please stand with me for the reading of Scripture as I read from Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads, and the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shabaniah, Benai, Sherebiah, Bani and Chanani, and they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Joshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabneah, Sherebiah, Hadiah, Sheb Shabaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting.' 
Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. You may be seated. An interesting scene to us. Some historians believe that the practice of putting earth on one's head and wearing sackcloth originated with funeral rites. Mourners, it is thought, would remove part of their garments and carry baskets of earth on their heads. That dirt was then used to cover the body of the deceased, creating a burial mound. Well, over time, methods of burial changed, but these symbols of mourning and death continued. Instead of carrying a basket of dirt or earth and, or dust was symbolically placed on the head, and as the body was placed in a tomb or whatever form of burial there was, the earth was then, or the dust was then thrown up into the air. Now, the point is, the Israelites were employing symbols of grief and death as they gathered together. What we see here is a national day of mourning. Now, there have been many situations and events in the book of Nehemiah that could provide more than enough drama for a major film. You could go back through and think of just how this could be portrayed on the big screen. From the first chapter in Nehemiah's weeping and tears and receiving word of the, the, the condition of, Israel, of Jerusalem and the walls there, or his bold approach to King Artaxerxes and his bold request, or Nehemiah's journey from Susa down to Jerusalem, or his middle-of-the-night examination of the walls, or maybe rallying this bedraggled community of Jews, rallying them together and encouraging them to build the walls, or how they rebuilt the, the walls and the gates. It's people gathered around the city with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other as their enemies threatened attack. Just event after event is just filled with drama. Or maybe last week's uh, reading, how the people gathered in the city, this rejoicing, this great rejoicing as they lived in these temporary shelters. All of those full of, full of drama. But I believe what we are getting into today and what we'll look at in the coming weeks in chapters 9 and 10 are actually the most important section of the entire book. Over the next two chapters, we'll see the Old Testament church engaged in covenant renewal with God. This renewal, not of the walls and the gates, but the renewal of the people, was Spirit-induced and God-honoring. And since we'll be considering this in the weeks to come, this idea of covenant renewal, I want to provide some foundational ideas today. So we could ask the question, what is a covenant? And which covenant was being renewed? Which covenant was being renewed there in Jerusalem? Well, as we'll see next week, God, as our Creator, has chosen to relate to people, His creature, created in His image, He's chosen to relate to us by way of covenant. In this context, you could think of covenant as a link between the Creator and His creatures. This link includes the terms of the relationship. And in Scripture, we find two primary covenants, the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. That first covenant, the covenant of works, was with Adam, and in it, life was offered to our first parents and their descendants. The terms or the conditions of that covenant for Adam were obedience, perfect and personal obedience. Therefore, we refer to it as a covenant of works. Perfect obedience would be rewarded with eternal life based on human character and actions. But we know the outcome of that covenant. Adam sinned. He did not keep the terms of the covenant. So he, along with all of humanity, was cut off from God, deserving of death instead of life. However, as we read all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and following, 
God was pleased to make a second covenant, a covenant that we refer to as the covenant of grace, because in it, God's people would rely on God's undeserved favor. That's what grace means, undeserved favor, unmerited love. God's later covenants with His people to include covenants with Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Israel, and even King David, all fell under this overarching covenant of grace, this covenant of undeserved love and favor. As stated in our confession, the same covenant of grace has been under various dispensations, but those are all expressions of the covenant of grace. Now, we often think, we often think, especially when we consider Moses and the giving of the law as a restatement or a dispensation of the covenant of works, not grace. But listen to the testimony of Scripture as we hear how God revealed Himself to Moses and how Moses responded. I want you to read with me or follow along in Exodus chapter 34. So I'm going to give you a moment to turn there. Exodus chapter 34, we're going to begin in verse 6. And as we listen to this passage, listen to how God reveals Himself to Moses and to His covenant people. So Exodus 34, beginning in verse 6. The Lord passed before him, that is before Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin." and take us for your inheritance. Now, God revealed Himself here to Moses and to His people as being a just God. He is just, but He is also merciful, gracious, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. In this covenant, God's character and actions are the foundation for the relationship He has with His people. In the covenant of grace... The foundation for that relationship is God's character and God's deeds. Moses admitted this in his response. He pleaded that God would be with the Israelites, not because they were compliant, not because they were obedient and deserving of His love. What did Moses say? We need you to be our God because we are a stiff-necked people. We need a God like you who will forgive. We need a God who is gracious because we are, we are weak and feeble. They would be totally dependent upon God and His character. Yahweh, who promised to pardon iniquity and sin. Now, there were many among the Jews who tried to use the covenant of grace as administered through Moses as a covenant of works. They misused or misrepresented that covenant of grace. They started attempting to keep the commandments of God and seeing them as markers of their personal worthiness, thus imagining that their obedience made them deserving of salvation. If we keep the law, then we deserve His grace. We deserve His love. They saw law-keeping as a way to show, actually, that they didn't need God's grace. This was, of course, utter folly because no matter how precise their law-keeping was, it wasn't perfect and their obedience couldn't undo the sinfulness of Adam or the ramifications his sin had on everyone descending from him. Instead of trusting God's character, those who would abuse the covenant of grace, trying to make it a covenant of works, they wanted their salvation to be earned or deserved or merited. Now, we may scoff at such attempts at self-righteousness. 
but we are tempted to do the very same thing. Here are a couple of ways that people can turn away from the covenant of grace, showing that they're actually relying on a covenant of works, which can't save. One one way is when we think our good deeds qualify us for God's love. A second way is thinking that our sins disqualify us from God's love. So the first person thinks something along these lines. My goodness and my righteousness are the foundation of my relationship with God. Since I'm succeeding today, reading my Bible regularly, doing all the chores mom asked me to do, since I'm making good grades right now and I'm holding my tongue well and I was even nice to my neighbor today, then my relationship with God is great. Our relationship is just humming along because look at how well I'm doing. He loves me. I mean, who wouldn't love me? My good works result in God's love. This person isn't in a relationship with God based on grace because that person doesn't think they need it. The second one, the second person, or the second way we can err is to think, my sins disqualify me from God's grace. So, since I'm failing in life, whether it's my personal life, my social life, the way I talk, the way I dress, the way I treat my spouse, you name it, because I'm failing, therefore God won't love me. Actually, He can't love me. My failure is too great for his love. This person isn't in a relationship with God based on grace because they think they don't deserve it. Actually, these two ways of rejecting the covenant of grace are very sim- very similar. Actually, they're nearly identical. Both reject grace because the focus is on man's side of the relationship, not on God. My point is Anytime we think our salvation is based on us, we have missed the boat. The covenant of grace, whether being administered in the Old Testament church or the New, is good news for sinners because it involves a saving relationship based on God's character and deeds, not ours. So, with that background, let's get back to Nehemiah. In chapters 9 and 10, we will be reading about and considering people renewing covenant with God. In their prayer to God, we will hear them appeal to Him as being a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It sounds a lot like Exodus 34, and that is exactly what we're going to hear them say in chapter 9, verse 17. They're appealing to God's character. And that does not sound like the appeal of people who are trying to claim that God is indebted to them because of their self-righteousness. Just the opposite. Now, in today's passage, we find them grieving. These people are fasting. They're dressed in garments of mourning. And this seems like a strange sequence. This is, the, this is after the Day of Atonement, and then after a week of rejoicing and celebrating the Feast of Booths, and now they're expressing such grief. The festivals of the month had reminded them, though, that God forgives, that God delivers, that God is their protector, that God is their provider. We would think, shouldn't they be celebrating? But we read in verse 2, And the Israelites separated themselves from the foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. Now this separation from foreigners or strangers isn't about being exclusive. It's about being set apart to God. It's about devotion to God. Now there were many different people groups living in Jerusalem and in that area. This wasn't to be a social community gathering of the broader community, this is what was a religious, spiritual response of God's people to His Word and to His character, even as they had been reminded, not only in Scripture, but through the festivals that they had just celebrated. So having remembered God's graciousness to deliver His people in the past and the present, they were pierced to the heart. They were cut to the heart and they grieved over their sin. 
every now and then there's a, a popular movie that surprises me. I'm often skeptical of a movie that appeals to the masses. Uh, recently there was a film called A Quiet Place that uh, I'd heard people talk about. It's, it's a bit of a suspense, scary movie, which I don't watch many of those. If you've seen it, you'll, you'll know well what I'm describing. If you haven't seen it, I'll try not to ruin it for you just in case you're going to watch it. But uh, Lori and I actually watched it this past week, and I was surprised. It's this dystopian tell of this family trying to survive in a, in a world that has been uh, ravaged by these alien presence. The story, though, that really grabbed me was about the relationship between parents and especially a father and his children. As they struggle to survive, the father and his children are increasingly estranged. His daughter begins to doubt that he loves her at all, so she fights against his authority. Meanwhile, his son refuses to obey because he doesn't trust his father's care for him. He doesn't trust that his father wants what is ultimately best for him. Well, at a critical point in the story, when his children are in this desperate moment of danger, the father makes his love clear to them in what he says and what he does. He expresses his love in the greatest possible way. And as the children look on, their, their father tells them that he loves them, and then he demonstrates his love. And in that moment, they were cut to the heart. The walls of doubt and anger and rejection that had separated them from him came crashing down, and they were decimated by his love. It's his love that cut them to the heart. And they wept in that moment. Undeserved love that has been displayed to us and for us, especially when we realize that we've doubted it in the past, can elicit sorrow. It should, but also joy. Here in Jerusalem in 445 B.C., the Jews recognized that they had not trusted their father's love. In both their recent past, but also going back for generations the Jews had repeatedly refused to trust and obey their loving Father. So now they gathered here. They gathered together again, but this time with empty stomachs and shabby clothes, with dirt on their heads. And after they had spent a month of celebrating His goodness, here they're humbly admitting that they didn't deserve any of that. They're admitting their unworthiness. They were mourning over their sin. People confess sin not only because God is holy. We confess sin not only because we see His holiness and our sinfulness, but we also confess sin because He is merciful. Confession of sin is an act of faith in God's willingness to forgive. We confess our sin because He has revealed Himself to be merciful and ready to forgive. This is a function of God's Word. His Word shows us our unworthiness, but it also shows us God's glory. It reveals our creaturely dustiness, but also God's magnificence. And that's what the people are responding to here. Now, there's another lesson in leadership that I don't want us to miss here. There are many lessons in leadership in Nehemiah. There's one here in, in verse 4 where we're told that the leaders... The leaders gathered, and they, with a, a loud voice, cried out to the Lord their God. Religious leaders led in confession of sin. They knew God, and they saw their sin, and they trusted His grace, and were willing to express that in front of the congregation. Leading, they were leading God's people through humility, even an open display of humility. When leaders are unwilling to confess their sin, when leaders are unwilling to express their need of God's grace, then they shouldn't be surprised when the congregants behave similarly. Now today, like every Sunday, today like every Lord's Day, you have been reminded already in the service of God's grace. Through the Scripture readings and the songs we've sung, you've been reminded that God has not only stated His love, but He has also demonstrated His love for you. He acted on that love. We read earlier from Colossians, 
in the assurance of pardon. How when we were dead in our trespasses, God gave us life and God forgave us. He did so not by simply clearing the guilty. As he told Moses, he won't just clear the guilty. Instead, he made atonement for the guilty. And he made atonement by nailing the record of our debt, of our sin, to a Roman cross by offering his own son in our place. That's how he dealt with our sin. And that display of love should pierce our hearts. In verse 6 and following, back in Nehemiah 9, uh, we're going to hear in the coming weeks what is perhaps a summary of their confession and their worship. We're going to take it a piece at a time. There are things that we can learn from its content, but also we can learn from its example for us. For today, in today's reading, I want you to notice something. After they had heard and observed God's Word, throughout the seventh month, they responded by humbly confessing their sin and their unworthiness, but also how worthy God is. Not only their unworthiness, but God's worthiness. Listen in verse 6. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord. You alone. You have made heaven. The heaven of heavens with all their hosts. The earth and all that is on it. The seas and all that is in them. You preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. Notice their focus. Praise for who God is, for God's unique character. God is creator. God is preserver. God is the object even of heavenly worship. So here we have in Jerusalem this group of doubting, stubborn, stiff-necked, often rebellious and spiritually fragmented people who've been humbled by their gracious God's undeserved love responding with praise. They couldn't keep their eyes and their minds off of God and His character. Remember, where the covenant of works focuses in on the character and the deeds of people, the covenant of grace is concerned with the character and the deeds of God. So how can we know if our grief is godly grief? If our mourning over sin is simply self-loathing, or humility before God. Well, godly grief leads to repentance. It doesn't ultimately turn inward and stay focused there. It always looks outward then toward God. Godly grief turns our gaze from our unworthiness to His worthiness because that is the source of our relationship with Him. That is the foundation and the hope of our salvation. Now, there are differences in the old and new administrations of the covenant of grace. The the covenant now is more broadly applied, praise God, than it was then. Where the covenant was initially with individuals and families in the Old Testament, it was then extended to the nation of Israel and now to the church, which is comprised of people from every tribe and every nation. And instead of knowing God as our Savior only through types and shadows, as the Old Testament saints did, through priest or or temple, we now see the one that all of those types and shadows pointed to, to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And our response then is faith in Him. Listen to Thomas Watson. He says, faith, faith, trusting, fetches all from Christ, and it gives all the glory to Christ. It is a humble grace. Faith is a humble grace because it looks outside of ourselves to Christ. So those who look in faith to Christ, the fulfillment of all of those types and shadows, they're members in the covenant of grace and experience something much better and more sure than the covenant of works ever offered. Here's Watson again. The covenant of grace is sure. It is confirmed with God's decree. And it rests then on two mighty pillars, the oath of God and the blood of God. That's what our faith looks to, and it is sure. So in the covenant of grace, we acknowledge God's glory and the fact that we are the beneficiaries of His undeserved love. Of all people, believers should be the most humble, as Peter tells us, be clothed 
with humility. We shouldn't be afraid to admit when we sin against God or one another. We shouldn't be afraid to admit the failures of the institutions even that we participate in. For the believer, repentance is actually a way of life. And as we read earlier, it is a saving grace. That means a humble and repentant heart is a gift from God. It's undeserved. It's unmerited. And it unashamedly looks to God for salvation and life. And He welcomes you into covenant with Himself. Now maybe, today even, you sense that your sin is too extreme. Your disregard for God in the past or the present too complete for you to possibly be in covenant with Him, in relationship with God. Well, listen to what the Lord says through Isaiah in chapter 43. You have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. I, I am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Or maybe you feel unworthy that God has, but I want you to know that God has chosen to express the glory of His character by showing mercy to guilty to the guilty and grace to undeserving people like us. Your unworthiness doesn't disqualify you from His grace. It's actually just the opposite. He chooses to love unworthy people. He chooses to lavish His grace on us. When you're tempted to pull away from God, when you're tempted to pull away from fellowship of other believers because you feel undeserving, I want you to remember the Israelites calling out to God with dirt on their heads. They knew that they too were unworthy, but that drove them to God because they had been reminded that the God who made heaven and earth is a God who is gracious and merciful and a God who forms relationship with His people and secures that relationship for all eternity. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, today we pray that You would come sweeping through us, through Your church. Bless us with the grace, with the gift of repentant hearts. Bless us with eyes that see our sin and then turn to see the character and the love of our Savior. Renew us today. And as we live in a world that is filled with injustice, Give us the humility and the confidence in You to confess our iniquities and our sin and even our part in that injustice. Where others pull away, help us draw near to You and to one another. Where others lash out in fear or anger, help us speak tenderly and compassionately with others about our Savior's love even as He willingly suffered for us to satisfy the Father's demand for justice by displaying His grace. So Holy Spirit, help us and renew us. Give us the joy that follows the sorrow, the joy of seeing Your glory and Your magnificence, of seeing Your love and seeing the assurance of our salvation in the finished work of Jesus Christ in the character of our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. If you would, please stand with me as we respond in song by singing the last two stanzas of O Breath of Life Come Sweeping Through Us. And we'll sing these words. Revive us, Lord. Is zeal abating? Will harvest while harvest fields are vast and white? Revive us, Lord. The world is waiting. Equip your church to spread the light. Let's stand together and sing these words together.
Savior has given us a meal, a meal that is a reminder and a sign and seal of the covenant that He has formed with us, the covenant of grace. In it, we are reminded of the demonstration of love that He has shown to us, the expression of the Father's love by sending His own Son, the expression of our Savior's love as He laid down His life for sinners, for us who are His enemies. In this meal, we celebrate the covenant of grace. We celebrate the one who has given his life to satisfy the Father's demand for justice, and in doing so, demonstrates even the Father's grace. And all of, all of the gifts of his grace are lavished on us in Jesus Christ. We have the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of our iniquities, even as Job said that God would bag up our iniquity. That he, would, that he would do away with our sin and remember them no more, as Isaiah says. This meal reminds us of that. As we are reminded, and as we participate today, may it elicit in us sorrow for sin, but joy in the finished work and in the character of Jesus Christ. So as we come to this table, this is a meal for believers who are resting in Jesus Christ alone, even as we said earlier, that faith is in Christ alone. This is for those who are resting in Jesus. But it is a meal that reminds us, that looks back. But also, as we partake, we experience the joy of communing with our Savior even now as the Spirit works within us. Our Savior who will come again. So if you would, please bow with me in prayer as we prepare to eat together. Holy Spirit, thank You. Thank You that You are at work in Your people and Your church. Revive and renew us even today as we're reminded of Your grace. And thank You for the gift of repentance, of humble hearts. And Lord, as we have confessed our sin today and as You, as you remind us of our unworthiness, then turn our eyes away from ourselves and fix our eyes on Jesus. Help us to see Him and the assurance and the confidence that we can have and His character and His deeds, even in securing our relationship with You. And so we come and we partake in this covenant meal, not by faith in ourselves, or faith in our character, or faith in our deeds, but faith in Christ. Not even faith in our repentance, but faith in Christ, the object of our faith and our hope and our peace. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you would read responsively with me. God nourishes us in the sacraments, means of grace in which His deeds elicit our response. In the supper, our Lord offers the bread and cup to believers to guarantee our share in His death and resurrection and to unite us to Him and to each other. We take this food gladly, announcing as we eat that Jesus is our life and that He shall come again to call us to the supper of the Lamb. On the night in which His betrayed, our Savior took bread. And after He'd given thanks, He gave it to His disciples, saying, This bread is My body, which is offered for you. Take and eat in remembrance of Me. After the meal, He took the cup. He gave it to His disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood, shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. This morning, if you would like to partake of the Elements will be here on the table. Juice will be on the left and wine on the right. If you would, after you've uh, received the elements, go back to your seats and then we will eat them together. Afterwards, if you would please discard your own cup. So, come and eat. Mm -hmm.
bread that we eat, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Take and eat in remembrance of Him. This cup that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink from it, all of you. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And we proclaim it joyfully, knowing that it was the very means of our salvation and our hope. As we respond, let's do so by singing a very appropriate hymn as we consider the covenant within which uh, we are members and partakers, and as we consider our relationship with God, we recognize that it is based on His character and His deeds. So if you would, respond with me as we stand together singing, To God be the glory, great things He has done. Let's stand together as we sing. the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And God's people said, Amen. I seen lift high.